Right. So good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning to the students sitting here and good morning to the students online as well. Uh, welcome to this new semester. For this semester, I'll be teaching on the ministry of the evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Uh, and uh, throughout this course, we'll be talking about uh, the fivefold ministry. We'll be talking about what is the ministry of uh, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher now. Uh, some of us may think, uh, what about the others, right? Uh, but we're going to talk about these three important points, and we'll also touch about the other uh, gifts and the callings that are there in the church. Um, so the course notes are available on Google Classroom. So uh, those who are online, feel free to download them. And uh, even as we continue with this course, you can uh, track along with us. I, uh, like what I always say in between, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask those questions and um, uh, we'll try our best to answer them. Right, so uh, shall we start with a word of prayer? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that even as we come together to study your word, you know, we pray, God, that you will minister to us, Holy Spirit, your word will be a seed. Lord, in our hearts, that will bear fruit in our lives, Lord, everything that we learn throughout all the sessions, Lord, let it uh, minister to us, let it strengthen us, Lord. and thank you, Lord, for teaching us uh, to continue to trust in you. Thank you for the plans that you have for each one of us, Lord. We come into today's class and uh, uh, in this entire course into your hands. We give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. All right, so um, let me just quickly present the notes. All right, so uh, this semester for this course, uh, I'll be taking it in two separate classes. There'll be two classes a week. So one will be today, and the other one is uh, tomorrow. So it's broken into two uh, days. Let's give it a moment, right? I mean, let's give them a lesson. Okay. All right, so we have the content page here. Uh, we start with uh, the introduction to the fivefold ministry. We'll talk about the evangelist, uh, how the Lord Jesus was that example. Then we go into the teacher and the pastor, right? Uh, I want to encourage each one of us, maybe if we have read the book, uh, The Shepherd's Staff, if you can get to your book, get the book, The Shepherd's Staff. It's a really good book. It talks about um, it's got aspects of the apostle, the prophet, the pastor, and the teacher, uh, the shepherd stuff. So this is a recommended study. Uh, I'm guessing it should be available on Amazon. Uh, but if you can get the book, maybe you can also circulate it among yourself. Uh, and if it is available, I will also post it on the group, uh, on the stream here. Okay, everyone can see my screen clearly. Do you want me to uh, increase the font? You can see the screen? Okay. All right, so let's begin this class. We'll talk about the introduction of the fivefold ministry. Right now, the Apostle Paul talks about this in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 through 16. Right? Now, we all know what the fivefold ministry is. What is the fivefold ministry? 
Those online, feel free to post on the chat. Yeah. Okay. All right, so we all know what the bipolar ministry is, but let's read Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 to 16. Now, even as we read this, now it's interesting to see that the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus. Uh, and out of all the churches, he's talking to Ephesus and he's saying, uh, you know, this is the, the church in Ephesus is a church where uh, there were already leaders, there were already deacons. Uh, so even when Timothy went to lead that church, there were already overseers, deacons. And, and so here he's setting things in place, right? He's saying, this is what the church is. And within the church, there's something called as the fivefold ministry. So Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 through 16. Let's read that. Anyone who asking me? Go ahead. Okay, so a, a very important point that we get we need to emphasize here is in verse 11, or verse 11, it says, it was he who gave some to be apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers. So what is a teacher? The apostle Paul is saying, it is not our own calling. It is not something that we get to choose. But God appoints it on our life. And the Lord put some of us to be apostles, pastors, teachers, and we see the fivefold ministry. So the ministry gift is a divine call. Right? As I've mentioned this before, just because we, you know, we like to travel doesn't mean okay, I'm, I'm, I can choose. Okay, I want to be an evangelist, or just because I like a church. And I like to, you know, be on the pulpit every Sunday. It doesn't mean I can choose. I want to be a pastor, or just because, you know, I want to be known as an apostle, so I choose an apostle. No, the point is the ministry gift is a divine call. It is God who appoints it upon ourselves. Now, how do we recognize it? Over time, we will recognize it, and, and we must understand. See, there are times when. Uh, you and I as believers, immediately we know, hey, God has called me for this. And you know that, okay, I'm going to do this. Like, for example, Pastor Ashish himself, he knew that he was going to start a church. Right? And this is when he was 13, 14 years old. Right? Now, you and I, for us, it may be different. For me, it may be, it maybe it'll take like five years for me to recognize, understand, okay, this is what I want to do. I always used to think, okay, what am I? Am I a worship leader? Am I a pastor? Am I an evangelist? Because I love to evangelize. So the whole time I was wondering, what am I? Right? But the point is, the ministry gift is a divine call. And God will orchestrate things as long as we are doing what he wants us to do. Right? The ministry gift is resident within the person. Right? Uh, just like how the Holy Spirit has nine gifts and it's resident inside of us, the ministry gift that is, uh, you know, we study that in uh, fulfilling God's purpose, right? Our gift and our callings always go together. It's like a railway track. They're always together. So the, the ministry gift, it's always there inside us. 
God has put it inside us. Right? Now, for example, I'm just using this example. Right? Say, for example, God has appointed one person to be a worship leader. And God has given this person a talent to play music and sing. Now, the gift is there. The gift is there inside. Now, when he is probably five, six, seven years old, or ten years old, he begins, he or she begins to understand, hey, I like music. Right? Yeah, and this is something that I want to do. So just because the gift is there, doesn't mean they become a worship leader automatically or they become a, in the they come, come into the worship team. Right? There's something that they have to do. They have to prepare themselves. They have to give their firstly, they have to give their life to the Lord. They have to prepare themselves. They have to ask God to, you know, empower them to be anointed of God. Then there's a practical of learning the music. And there's so many things involved. Same thing with the pastor. If you, if you know that you're going to be a pastor, oh, there's so much we have to do. Right? You know, okay. There's, there's prayer, there's reading of the word, there's preparation of the word. If we cannot do it in our own strength. And we know it. So this ministry is resident inside us. But the more we exercise it, we walk in that, the anointing of God comes and begins to use that gift in a powerful way. Right? So what is important here? We must understand. If sometimes we don't know what our gift is, so many of us may have questions. And I don't know what I am. I don't know if I'm a worship leader, apostle, prophet, or I don't know if I'm in the workplace. I don't know if God has called me to start a business. I don't know what I am. The gift is inside me. Right? Now, when you read about ministry gifts, later we'll talk about that as well. Uh, ministry gifts can expand to different kinds of gifts, right? Uh, so, for example, some people are involved with the gift of healing, or some of them are involved with the gift of, uh, you know, they have this gift of ministering to people through through art and craft. There's a gift of dancing. Right? There's some who are gifted in talking. Right? Wow. So there are different kinds of these gifts. But the point is, we need to step into it. It's like this, there's a shoe. And you're looking at that shoe, and you know that shoe is something good for you. It's good for your future. All we have to do is wear it and walk in it. Other things will fall into place. It's like a puzzle. Start, start the course. God will bring things into you. Like, you know, what is the best example? So many examples we can think of. Let me just think, give you two examples. Right? One is Moses. What did God tell Moses? It's very interesting. He said to Moses, Moses, you are going to, the, your name means you've been drawn out of water. I protected you from the time you were born so that you can, the main reason was to bring you, up, bring the people of Israel out of Egypt. That was the, your only task. Right? That's that's all I want you to do. Now he knew it. He knew there was a gift inside him. There was he knew there were leadership gifts inside him. How did he know? It's in the book of Numbers. He says uh, he himself writes that he says Moses was eloquent in speech. He was trained in the past. He knew he had leadership skills, right? And he didn't recognize where to use those leadership gifts and how to use it. Because he made a mistake. But we see that later on, and he was 80, and he encountered the burning bush. His leadership gifts were still there inside. But what was he doing for 40 years? Looking after sheep. And imagine how he's, you don't need any leadership skill for looking after sheep. Not at all. But this gift was there inside. The moment God told him, get ready, pack your bags, he knew it. It was as if those gifts came back. It was all inside, it just came back. So those gifts that are there, it's irrevocable. Nobody can take it out from you. But you and I as believers have the option to use it or to suppress it. You get what I'm saying? 
right? We have the option to use the gift or to suppress it, to walk in the gift or to say, no, that's not what I want to do. The option is ours, but the gift is there. Look at Joseph. God told Joseph, Joseph, your brothers will bow down before you. So he knew he was special. He knew he was a gift. There were, he knew there were certain things inside of him, and he knew it. Right. But what all he had to go through? Did the gift go away? When he was in prison? When he was, you know, looking at all of the things that are happening? No. Oh, he was still there. He was still able to interpret dreams. He was still a leader under Pharaoh's, uh, under Potiphar's prison. He was a leader. Right? So the gift is always there in silence. Now, how do we recognize? That is a different topic altogether. But it's there. It's there. Right? Now, the ministry gift, which is resident with the person, men and women are Christ's gift to the church. Right? So when we look at the church, the body of Christ, now why did God give us gifts? For example, the fivefold ministry. Why did he give us? If you read that verse, he very clearly it says, It is he, verse 11, it is he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. To do what? This is the note of this. One, to prepare God's people for works of service. Right, first point. The gifts are given to prepare God's people for works of service. Not a show off. It's not to be called a prophet, not to be called a apostle. For what? For to prepare people for the works of service. So if we are a apostle or we are a prophet or we are teaching and preaching the word, our main intention is to prepare people for the work of service. That is what build them up into a place of maturity. That's our number one priority. Number one. It's not even about us. Right? It's about the people. Yeah. That's the first one. What is the second one? So that the body of Christ may be built up. Now we're preparing people for what? To serve under you? Or preparing people so that you know they may know that you know you're a leader, or what is the reason? Yes, it's very clearly saying. So that the body of Christ may be built up. So kingdom mindset. One, we are doing this so that we build people up in, into maturity. Two, when they are at mature, not that they should sit and you know follow us and do whatever we say, but no. The point is the body of Christ be built up, and then until we reach the unity of the faith in the knowledge of the Son of God. Until we reach the unity of faith. So all of these gifts that God has given to the church is given for a reason. But now when you look at the church across globally, over time, you know, the church has grown revelation upon revelation. We have grown in different areas. But now when you look at the church, it's more or less become a competition. Or it's become a place of, you know, um, oh, what should I say? Not everywhere, but a lot of places. It's become a place of uh, pride. That's not what God has meant. I've put all of them so that they can build the body of Christ. That's the whole point. It is not to build our own kingdom. Yeah. And it's very sad to see when, you know, prophets, apostles, they make these prophecies which are not true and you know just to you know, entice people you know, the many times we have heard of people you know people have sent me videos and links asking is this right where prophets have said if you don't do this you know you know you won't have uh, an income or you won't get a raise so if you don't give uh, so much money this will happen uh, to your to your life, your children, you will never receive healing. All of these things. Is that what prophecy is for? Is that building the body of Christ? 
So we must be very careful as well. Right? So these gifts given to the church are to build the church. And you and I, as men and women of God, we represent Christ's ministry to the church. Now, picture this. The Lord Jesus did ministry for three and a half years. He set the example. What did he do? Of course, there was no church. Right? What did he do? He set the example. He said, go, preach the gospel, lay hands on the sick, teach them, heal, do miracles. And he did all of that. He traveled from my you know, being the Messiah, he could have just sat in one place. He just been in Jerusalem, finished the thing, okay, three, three and a half years. Why should he struggle? Right? Yesterday, one of the students asked me, uh, you know, after lifestyle evangelism, they were asking me, how can we go to these difficult areas and preach the gospel? Now, the Lord Jesus went to difficult areas. In his own city, in his own hometown, People ridiculed him, his own family ridiculed him, right? But he set the example. You and I, we represent Christ in this tree. Right? Do we represent Christ? Yes, yes or no? Yes. We represent Christ. So whether we are happy, angry, sad, whatever we do, we represent Christ. So our ministry also represents Christ. If we do ministry the right way, it will represent Christ. If we do ministry the wrong way, it will show, it will point out, hey, see what your, your Christian people are doing. And it's, it is heartbreaking to hear, you know, stories of pastors and leaders in the church who've been dragged to court because of different reasons. Why? Because it's affecting them. The ministry is back in the church. We represent the church. Right? In many places, you know, we, we see, we hear of you know, the prosperity, many other things. We must remember when we are teaching and preaching the word of God, we represent him. And we must do it carefully. The purpose of the fivefold ministry, there are three bullet points there uh, for the perfecting of the church. So for the sorry, for the perfecting of the church of the saints, then for so that the saints can do the work of the ministry, right? and then resulting in the body, in the building up of the body of Christ. Threefold purpose there. Then this will continue till when. Three bullet points there. We will till we all come to the unity of the faith. That means what? This whole fivefold ministry, pastors, apostles, prophets, teachers, and all the other gifts will continue till we all come to the unity of the faith. And when will that happen? When will we all come to the unity of the faith? You think of it. It is until we are in the rapture, right? Until the rapture happens. So until the rapture happens, it will go on. God will continue to raise up apostles, prophets. The fivefold ministry will continue to grow, and the enemy will continue to rise to stop it. So it's going to be a battle, right? Um, but it will grow. The fivefold ministry will grow. The church will grow. We have Jesus' promise. He says, I will build my church. The gates of hell. How is he building the church through you and me? Through the fivefold ministry. And when till next one, till when does it, will all this continue? Till we all come to know, come to the knowledge of the Son of God. And till we all come to this level of understanding, right? When we the Apostle Paul writes in all of his letters, what is the one thing very commonly he keeps stating? He says, that I may increase in the knowledge of God, that I may increase in him. Right? I was reading a couple of passages this morning, and I came to this passage. Let's think about this. Apostle Paul, he has 
seen all the revelations of God. He has seen, he has done great things. He has started the church, he has started, uh, you know, he's written so many books, he has first hand encounters with God. But in the book of Ephesians, he says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection in me. Can you think of that? So Paul is not saying, okay, I'm done. And, uh, sorry, not Ephesians, it's in Philippians, Philippians 7, 3, I think, which is a, the, the book of Philippians is a prison episode, right? So it's during his last days. And he's writing and saying, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection in me. Right? Wait a minute, Paul, you already know enough. From the time you're a young boy, you also went to the desert. The Lord Jesus spoke to you personally, right? You you went up to the third heavens. You have seen miracles. You've done great things. You already know Him. Many places you have said, "I could." Uh, the Lord Jesus Himself came and ministered to Him in the prisons. You already know Jesus. What does He say? That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection, until we all come to the knowledge of God. What does it teach us? What does it teach us? It teaches us that all of this, we are just a drop in the ocean. There is so much that we can learn. This book of Revelation, it does not end with a BTH or a Masters. Just because we get a Masters, it doesn't end there. There's so much. right? And, and that's what we are here for as a body of Christ. Uh, until we continue to grow in the knowledge of the Son of God, the fivefold ministry will continue to develop. Right? And lastly, we all will, until we all come to a perfect or mature man, the full measure of Christ's stature. So all of this will happen until we walk like Christ in this world. Last Sunday, we, uh, on the Sunday sermon, we spoke about um, you know, praying for those who persecute, praying, blessing those who persecute you. Now, is that easy? It's so difficult, right? Even as I was preaching, I was thinking to myself, it's not easy, right? But we cannot do it in our flesh through carnal ways. We cannot forgive somebody who has hurt us through the flesh. We cannot. If we want to bless those who persecute us, we have to do it only through the Spirit. And doing that makes us mature, takes us to the place of maturity. Right? So, so all that we are learning, I just want to make a note here, like, you know, so some of us may say, hey, I'm, I'm called to start a business, or some of us may say, I'm a housewife, or, uh, you know, I'm just wor working in the corporate sector, or this, you know, I just wanted to learn God's word, so I'm joining the sessions. It doesn't matter. Right? All of us are believers. All of us are ministers. Right? So it's not like only if I'm a prophet, only if I'm a teacher, I will go and minister to people. What was Apostle Paul's work? What was, uh, you know, uh, later on you see in Paul's episodes? What was uh, Phoebe's work? She was a merchant in Claude. And you know, if you look at Stephen, what was Stephen's work? Menial task. Right? So it's it's not that we have to be this, only then we can minister. Right? God will place things in our life until we come through all of this. So if you say you're a worship leader, hey, I'm not there in the fivefold ministry, that's okay. Don't feel bad. Why God didn't add worship in this fivefold ministry? But you know what's the best part? All of this will pass away, but worship will remain. That's why God didn't put it here. <laughs> you think of that? I used to think of that because I was only leading worship. Say, like, God, I'm not there on that list. I'm not there on the list, fivefold ministry. The Lord very clearly spoke to me. He said, I'm talking about 15 odd years back. And I understood that all of this apostle, prophet, pastors, teachers, evangelists, nothing is needed in heaven. 
Do we need all of them? But what is there in heaven? Worship. Get used to it. <laughs> we have to get used to worship. Let's keep worshiping. So I'm used to that. Right? So don't feel bad. There's a reason. See, the Holy Spirit knows exactly what he's doing. Right? Okay. So whatever the the gift that God has placed in you, don't limit yourself. Don't say, okay, since I'm not in this list, so I can, you know, this doesn't apply to me. No, it applies to us. Right? Even if you're a housewife, you're a workplace, it applies to us. Right? Let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28 to 30, 31. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 12, 28 to 31. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then the gifts of healing, helps, administrations, directions, and signs. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers and miracles? They all have gifts of healings, they all speak in tongues, they all interpret. But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more ascended. Right. So again, here Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. Now I've mentioned this before. The church in Corinth was a troubled church. It was a church that was flowing in the gifts of God. There was working of miracles, there was prophecy, there was word of knowledge, all the gifts, people are flowing in the gifts. There was division. There was confusion. Now, I wouldn't say that the division was because some were all possible, some were prophets, no. What happened was, some are saying, I follow Paul, some are saying, I follow Apollos, some are saying, I follow Cephas. That was one problem. And you learn about uh, the, in detail about uh, the letter of Paul to the Corinthians next year. But here, Paul is writing here, and he is bringing some important points here, right? Let's read that. Uh, let's just break it down. 12, 28 to 31. Yeah, let me just break it down. And in the church, God has appointed, first of all, prophets, sorry, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers. Now, it looks like it's confusing here. Because a five-four ministry says something, yeah? if we go on, it says teachers, then working of miracles, workers of miracles. That's not there in the list. Also, those having gifts of healing, again, that's not there in the list. And those to help others, not in the list, those with gifts of administration and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. Now, what's happening here? You will see that this, this whole fivefold ministry, so Paul is dividing it. He's saying, in these ministry, you will also have these functions that are available. Now, administrator is not there in the fivefold ministry, right? But a pastoral calling will have administration, right? Uh, gifts of healings and miracles is part of the pastoral, apostle, teachers, everyone, right? So it's part of all of that as well, right? So the point that Apostle Paul is doing is trying to bring out here is, see, in the church in Ephesus, he was trying to emphasize, okay, this is the fivefold ministry, but here the church of God, he's trying to bring out the, the aspects or the, the, the reasons or the why this ministry is there. Right? Now, this is a built up church, it's a big church. Ephesians was still not here, it was a growing church. Right? In, in this, we must understand a few points. Let's look down, let's go down, it says. The order stated in 1 Corinthians 28 must be understood both as one of establishment, the way in which the early church unfolded. God gave the apostles first, 
then came the prophets, and then the teachers. Right? So if you look at the book of Acts, the apostles came first. Right? So there were 12 apostles. Right? They were first. They were leaders of the church. The apostle Peter started it. The foundation was built. Right? Uh, when we see that he preached that sermon, the first sermon, uh, thousands of people came to Christ. The church was built. The apostles were first. God used them first. Then came the prophets. So if you look at in the book of Acts, uh, the church in the church in Jerusalem and then the church in Antioch. Acts chapter 11, uh, 19 onwards, talks about the church in Antioch, right? Now you've got Jerusalem in one place, you've got Antioch, right? So what's happened is Jerusalem is a big church, thousands of people. Antioch is a smaller church, but in that church, in the Antioch church, there were already prophets. There were already people who were prophesying. Now can you believe that? You know, here you've got apostles, you've got the church, you've got pastors, you've got people inside administration. And here in the church in Antioch, you've already got prophets. So people are prophesying in the church. So that is why later on, you know, Paul goes to Barnabas, they send Barnabas, go to the church in Antioch and help them out. Right? So first was the apostles, second was the prophets. So of course, even the church in Jerusalem later on, there were prophets and uh, God raised up many prophets to build the church. And then there were teachers. Right? So within the, within the community, within the church community, you see Apollos, right? Aquila and Priscilla, they were more inclined towards teaching. And what did they do? Uh, Apollos came, he, he, was, he was listening to the sermon, and he was a wonderful teacher of the word of God, right? But he hadn't heard about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So they spoke to him, and then he became a great teacher. Right? So we see all these gifts coming out. One establishment, that is the apostles, then were the prophets, and the teachers. Now, what is important is God is not saying the apostles is number one rank, rank number one. Prophets is rank number two, and teachers is three. No, he's not saying that. So in hermeneutics, we learn, right? We need to take text, put it into context. In many places, Paul says, we're all one in the body of Christ. There's, there's no Jew, there's no Greek. We're all one, right? So why is he bringing this first, second? You must understand that he's trying to set a hierarchy. This is how it is supposed to be within a church. Now, if you look at any organization, right? If there's no hierarchy, what will happen? Yeah. It's chaos. If you look at a church also, imagine a church with no hierarchy. Ten of them making one decision. It's a waste of time. Five of them will say no. Five of them will say yes. And you're stuck in between. So you need leadership. You have to make decisions. Some decisions will be good, some will be hard, but it's good to have a hierarchy. Now in the church as well, right, we have many volunteers and they genuinely care for the church. So they come up with a lot of ideas. Sometimes I'll have to say yes, sometimes I'll say no. This, we need to make, make sure that the church is benefited with every decision that we make. Right? Then, there's one of leadership, government responsibility, governmental responsibility and authority. Then there is an anointing that goes with each ministry gift. And so within the church, there's an anointing. Right? So not everyone can be worship leaders, but you will have some people who are anointed in terms of prayer. They can pray. Now, not everyone can pray for a long time. I remember this time couple of months back, this uh, wonderful one of our church members, she came up to me and said, Pastor, I don't know 
anything. I don't know anything. I, I, whenever you want me to serve, I'll serve. But one thing I can do, Pastor, I can pray for your church. I can spend time in prayer. So if you want me to pray or start a prayer team, I can do that. I said, yeah, go ahead, start a prayer team. So it's not easy, right? To, so she, she likes to, she has that burden of prayer. And there was another person all, all, all within the church. He came up to me and said, see, Monday to Friday at work. But I finish, I start my work only at three in the evening. So from morning to afternoon, I have nothing to do. Right? So till three o'clock. So till about one o'clock, so morning to till one o'clock, I'm open to go out and share the gospel. I like to do that. I feel that God is coming. Now, these are corporate girls who work in the corporate sector. And I said, can we do that? I said, yeah, we can start ministry teams. Find somebody else with you to go to by two. Did Jesus do that? Joseph 72 said, go oh, to by two. Right? So there is an anointing that goes with every ministry. You, you look at an evangelist or you look at a pastor, there is an anointing that goes with that. So when you and I pray, when we spend time in God's presence, it is very important to ask God to anoint us. The anointing is important. right? Because if we keep doing something and we know that it's our gift and calling, but if there's no anointing, what will happen? There will be perfect. But it is the anointing only that makes the difference. Right? It is the anointing which touches people's lives. Imagine you're leading worship. You can choose the most boring song. Right? But if it's anointed of God, it will touch people. I remember this one time I was singing a song. I think it was uh, Blessed Be the Name of the Lord. It is a fast song. It's a fast song. It's a, you know, it's a faster song. It's a praise song. Usually, worship song only everyone starts crying. But the praise song. And this person came up to me and said, "Oh, yes, it be the name of the Lord. I really, I was touched. So very serious. Mm -hmm. touched by himself. Blessed be the name. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. When you said that, I felt God's presence like a tower next to me. Now, what is it? We've sang the song hundreds of times." Right? But you ever think of those when it's anointed of God, when God anoints a song, we can use words like this to touch people's songs. So God is not restricted to worship songs on a keyboard. He's not interested in all that. It is part of it. But the anointing is what makes the difference. So that is our responsibility. Some of you want to become pastors, you need the anointing. We cannot do it in our own strength. We cannot. Right? You, can, you can carry it for maybe one year, two years. After some time, you will feel, oh, there's something wrong. I have to get right. I need the anointing. Right? God will take a person through point nine. I'm at point nine. So God will take a person through stages of preparation, growth, and development in their ministry. God will take a person to stages of three things preparation, or growth, and development. Now, preparation, very important. And I've talked a lot about this, right? Preparation time is never wasted time, it's important time, it's time that God teaches us, He removes things from us. He removes, there are some things that we need, he, he strengthens us, there are some things that he would say, get it out of your life. Right? So preparation is very important. Now the preparation can involve two things. Right? I'll just uh, talk about these, and then we will close, we'll pick up from uh, the next class. Preparation involves two things. One, uh, practical preparation, and two is a spiritual experience. Preparation. So I want to just uh, let's put spiritual preparation first. First spiritual preparation, then practical. What is spiritual preparation? Okay, God, go back to the place of prayer, reading God's word, worship, 
spending time in God's presence, meditating on His words. That is number one priority, the preparation stage. God did that for people in the Bible? Almost everyone. There's very rarely a time God has used somebody and said, okay, uh, since you're good, you, you'll be there. No. David, how many years? 17 years. Paul, 17 years. Moses, 14 years. Joshua, maybe about 10, 15 years. Everyone he has taken them through stages. So preparation is important. And during that preparation time, they prepare themselves. So even as we are here, preparing for the things ahead, it's, it's a time where we prepare spiritually, we read, we spend time in God's presence. And even as we are doing it, comes the practical preparation. Right? I remember this very clearly. When I was in Bible College, no? I, I, I was just learning about worship. I, I could lead maybe three, four songs at one time. So suddenly they said the one hour worship. Now one hour worship, how many songs you choose? Ten songs. <laughs> so I used to choose eight songs, eight, nine, ten songs sometimes. One after the other. <laughs> no, see, I didn't know much. I didn't know. I didn't know how to lead. I didn't know like prophetic worship and spending time in worship. It was very new to me. So I would send 10 songs, song list for today's. Uh, <laughs> and we had one guy on the, uh, you know, we had a drum kit that time. And one guy would play that. And all 10 songs continuously play over. Uh, and over time, I realized, hey, it is not a show. And then I began to learn, OK, let's make it eight songs. Let me spend time. I began to watch videos, began to learn from people around. And then grew, spent more time in God's presence, learning at home. And then I was able to okay, understand, okay, I can do this, I can exhort, I can uh, you know build people up, I can do, I can, I can declare verses, and it all became a learning. But it was all in the preparation time. Thank God for the Bible calls that way. It was free, I can do it, right? So preparation. Preparation will enable us to grow. In the Lord. If you are only preparing and not growing, then something is wrong. You must see yourself growing. And that growth must bring development in your ministry gift. And the Lord will take us through these stages. Be ready to go through. Very important point. Don't grumble through those stages. Let those stages, let God take his time through those stages. All right. So we will stop here. Uh, and we will continue tomorrow is our next class um, so we will continue then uh, shall we just say a quick word of prayer and we will close father we thank you for what we studied today we thank you lord uh, for the online students as well we pray lord that you will continue to teach us and continue to lead us in the us lord. we thank you for this time um, we give you all the praise and glory in jesus name we pray Amen. And thank you for to those who are online. God bless you.